We are, uh, we're going to finish our baptism service that we began back in the fall. We had three who couldn't be here, uh, one out of town and a couple that were ill. And uh, so this morning's a special morning. You notice the tank up here. That's not a new musical instrument. Uh, this is filled with warm water. And uh, we get to hear the testimonies of God's grace uh, from three of ours here this morning. So Jeremy and Lori Lehman are going to come up and Alex Robles is going to come up. And you need to know something about baptism. Baptism does not confer grace. It does not do anything meritorious for a sinner before a holy God. Uh, baptism is an outward symbol of an inward reality that has already taken place. And it's an inward reality uh, moved, done, accomplished by God's Holy Spirit through the gospel. Uh, these who are coming to give testimony of God's grace, uh, they're not better than anybody. They didn't fix their lives. They didn't clean themselves up or pull themselves up by their own moral bootstraps. They are sinners who recognize they needed a Savior. And they're going to come tell you about what their Savior has done for them. So, Jeremy, why don't you come up first? Good morning. Well, for those that do not know me, my name is Jeremy Lehman, and uh, today I have the privilege of boasting in my Savior, Jesus Christ. My family has been part of Grace Bible Church since 2010, and I've served as a deacon at Grace Bible Church since 2013. Our family also served in Papua New Guinea, along with the Cans and the Dodds. And over the last seven years, my study of Scripture and discipleship have only increased. During that time, I grew in my conviction that although I formally believed that I was saved at a very young age, that was just not the case. I grew up in a Christian home as a pastor's kid, and for as long as I can remember, I've been part of a church function and activities. I was a faithful attender of Sunday school classes and Awana programs. I was also an individual who served as a sound engineer with my dad as he planted a new church in Anthem, Arizona. Now, my original profession of faith occurred when I was eight years old, but shortly after that, I was also baptized and then challenged growing up into my teen years. As I moved into those years, I was faced with the temptation of the world, and the testing of my profession now came to the surface. Rather than fighting temptations to sin and clinging to Christ, I really enjoyed what the world had to offer. I found myself continually bound up and patterns of a fear of man, fear of demons, and a regular pursuit of lust through sensual sins through the internet. When I was caught in sin, my pattern was to shift blame, not take responsibility for my actions, which led me to regularly lie to and deceive the individuals that had caught me. My life was characterized with an outward appearance of righteousness, while my internal motivations, desires, and thoughts were patterned towards self-love. I was a religious hypocrite. I would fall into sin. My conscience would convict me of it. However, my response to this was just to do better. Or I'd make agreements with God about how I would never do that again. It was clear that my efforts and my means of change were self-directed, motivated primarily on my emotions. Frankly, I just I didn't think I was a bad person. And even though I was bound in fear, patterned by deception, and a habitual fornicator. Something else that characterized this period of my life was a lack of clarity regarding God's word. Ironically, I can clearly remember not understanding what I was reading. I would highlight my Bible as I read it, but it wasn't a source of joy, delight, and comfort in times of need. I knew who Jesus was, but I lacked a relationship with him. I knew him, but I didn't know him. There was a change that came during my early 20s through a series of events. While I was in the college group in my church, there was a growing sensitivity to God's word, coupled with a greater understanding of what sin was. I also started to have opinions about what the Bible said, even though I did not study it enough to be speaking to it. Regardless, there was a change in how I was thinking about everything. In 2004, Lori and I were married, and early in our marriage, there was an event that for a time pushed us away from our church. As a result, I began studying through the book of Genesis with another believer. During that time, I was introduced to John MacArthur. 
A past friend shared an audio link to a Shepherds Conference Q&A regarding election and predestination. Now, while I was listening, he was stating that this teaching is everywhere in Scripture. And at some point, he stated that the book of Ephesians clearly spelled out this doctrine. And I just didn't realize that he simply began reading from chapter 2. I'm listening, and I'm thinking that he's still giving commentary. And all the time, I noticed he was simply reading verses 1 through 9. And it says this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. I remember saying, it actually says that. Um, I felt as though I was reading my Bible for the very first time. I understood it. Um, better yet, on top of those things, I saw my life in those verses, categorized in verses 1 through 3, following the course of this world. Even though I was not pursuing such things with outward boldness, those patterns were there privately and inwardly. I also understood why I needed saving. I have more in common with the most immoral person than a, than a, uh, than a Christian. From that point on, I began to truly see changes in my past patterns of life. Rest assured, I was not glorified at that moment, and I presently am not glorified at this moment. But I began to see changes in my life as things moved on. I still fell into temptation and sin, but unlike my responses in the past, I took responsibility for my actions. I also knew Jesus had paid for my sin. I knew that I had been made perfectly righteous through Jesus' death on the cross in my place. Bit by bit, little by little, old habits were broken down, new ones were being formed. And rather than having a life characterized as driving on the interstate of the world, with occasional exits to do good things or maintain appearances. Now my life was characterized as driving on the road of faith in Christ, with occasional exits into the pitfalls and temptations of sin. I had also a desire to learn more truth from God's word. Lori and I both were regularly listening to sermons. I began reading my Bible with more clarity, as well as memorizing scripture. I had a love for Jesus because I understood just how bad my sin was before a holy God. He gave me eyes to see that he judges my secret internal desires, intentions, and thoughts the same as their worst outward sinful behaviors. I was a self-righteous habitual hypocrite, inwardly patterned by desires, intentions, and thoughts that were opposed to God's glory. I had no real depth of love for Christ because I did not truly see the depth of my sin. God himself had orchestrated every event in my life to lead me here. He placed me in a home of believing parents who regularly communicated the gospel to me. I heard sermons from my dad each Sunday that communicated my need for a savior. I knew Bible stories because I had heard them my whole life growing up. My hidden pursuit of the world, coupled with a working conscience, buried me in guilt. He brought about unexpected circumstances that ultimately led me to saving faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And unlike me, Jesus' motivations, his desires, and his thoughts were only God-glorifying. His outward actions matched his perfect internal motivations. He was not a deceitful fornicator or a man-fearing trembler. He was and is presently unmarred, unatched, and unable to sin. Through his death on the cross in my place, I am forgiven. And now, I know him. I'm getting baptized today in obedience to my loving king. 
And through faith in his son, he's already washed away my sin, bringing me from death to life inwardly. It is out of joy to demonstrate that outwardly. Jeremy, in uh, keeping with your profession of faith in Christ, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. into a single parent home. My mom married my stepdad when I was eight, and the Lord was gracious in that they were both believers and I was able to grow up in a Christian home. I recall my parents sharing the gospel with me often. They would state continually that I needed to accept Jesus into my heart. I remember praying to accept the gospel, believing I was a sinner, that Jesus died for my sin, and I was baptized at the age of nine along with my mom the same day. As I moved through my elementary, middle school, and high school years, there was not much evidence of growth in my faith. I did attend church, youth groups, many youth camps, um, as well as attended a private Christian high school. These all grew me in knowledge, and I believe this laid a foundation of truth in my life. But there was a lack of trial and testing that had yet to come. I knew I wasn't perfect, but I didn't see myself as a very bad kid. Um, I could say that I believed in God's word to be true, that I loved him, but my life did actually not show evidence um, for these statements of faith. My parents and siblings moved to, from California to Arizona in 2002. I came out to visit them in the month of December. And during that visit, I met my future husband, Jeremy. I moved to Arizona, and Jeremy and I began dating. And a year and a half later, we were married in 2004. Our first few months of marriage were really sweet. Um, the following years, though, two years or so, were, were horrible. Um, <laughs> we... Uh, fought and cried and gave the silent treatment. Our roles of how God designed marriage to be were completely out of order. One night during this time in our marriage, a wife from our weekly Bible study group, um, she gave me a book on being a godly wife. I was initially very offended, thinking that I needed such a book. Um, however, as I began to read the book, it was one of the first times I think I was really seeing my sin as God saw my sin. I saw how I was fighting to lead our marriage, and I was in opposition to Scripture. Um, I journaled my way through the book as I read, and I did the application given at each chapter, and it was a struggle each day as I strove to obey the commands of the Lord. And as I completed the book about a year later, I was amazed to see the work that the Lord had done in me and our marriage. Mm -hmm. I believe this is when the assurance of my salvation was truly evident to myself, that I did love God, and that I did have a desire at a heart level to walk in obedience to what his scripture says, and more than pursuing my own ways. God says um, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, the love of God has truly been perfected, and by this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. A short time later, Jeremy and I had a difficult situation that came up, which resulted in us leaving our current church. And through this transition, seeking a new church, we were introduced to Grace to You Online, Pastor John MacArthur's teachings. Um, through listening online, we were exposed to expository preaching. And I was overwhelmed, and I couldn't get enough. It was a wonderful time in my life for understanding the gospel more clearly and the word of God. Jeremy had a job change to the East Valley of Phoenix, and in January 2010, we, um, we moved over here and were encouraged by friends to begin attending Grace Bible Church. We were so thankful to find a local church that had expository teaching. Once we joined GBC, I only continued to grow in my understanding and love for the gospel. I was also growing in understanding how to read my Bible, the differences of justification and sanctification, seeing my sin, having a repentant heart, 
My growth was built up in, from so many of the discipling programs here as well. My desire to spend time in the Word each day only increased as a result of all of this teaching. I also was becoming equipped to share the gospel with others. I could clearly define that God is a holy God and man is a sinner against him. Man is unable on his own to restore this relationship. God is the one who can and must restore it. He did this through the sending of his son Jesus to come to earth, to live a sinless life, to become that perfect sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to his father, to die in the place for sinful man, and yet not all sinful man, but only for those who actually place their faith in his son to save them, to take their place in sin and judgment upon himself in our place. And in doing so, the sinner is declared righteous by faith alone in Jesus. Jesus says in John 3.36 that he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, and the wrath of God abides on him. As years have passed, I'm so thankful for the firm foundation of my God and Savior Jesus Christ that has been strengthened within me by his word. I've had various seasons of trials um, where the Lord has continued to draw me closer to him, and in all circumstances, the Lord continues to humble and prune me through his word and the work of the Holy Spirit within me. I have only grown in being assured of my salvation and the saving work of my Savior on my behalf. It's by his grace that I continue to persevere in knowing and loving him. In Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 10, Paul writes, But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? I am here to be baptized today because I want to be obedient to the Lord's commands of baptism. If there was a possibility, I was not saved at a young age. And although I do not know specifically the day in which the Lord gave me new life, I can from today look back and now see and testify that there are marks of fruit in my life as a believer and that I have been saved by his grace. Thank you for the opportunity to boast in my Jesus. because of your profession of faith in Christ, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. My name is Alex Robles. My, I was born in Mexico in a family where we believed in God, but we went to church only on special occasions and rarely ever studied the Bible, if ever. My parents always taught me to believe and to trust in God and to strive to do the right thing and to, to be a good person. My knowledge of Jesus was limited to what I've been taught by our family members or to what I've been found in good pit, bits of wisdom to rest my mind on. All I really understood growing up was that there is a God and Jesus was sent by God to be our savior. And if we thank them enough in everything we did, he would bless us with a life filled with happiness and he will provide what we need as we go through life. To grow up in a home where I could be a happy kid with both of my parents being able to spend time as a family is a blessing God gave me before I even knew who he truly is. When I was seven years old, my parents and I moved to Arizona. Our whole life was shaken up and being in a new country as an only child was very intimidating. But with the help of my parents, encouraging me constantly and teaching me to be a positive, helpful, and honest kid, I was able to build a normal and happy life. During high school, another blessing came into my life, this time in a form of a girl named Bree. We became high school sweethearts our junior year, stayed together, although in different states, through college, and we became husband and wife along the way. It all happened so fast, and we didn't know how to have a true understanding of the challenges and expectations that come with marriage, especially as a Christian couple. As a kid, I knew baseball was what I wanted to do, 
and I wanted to do whatever it took to reach my goal. I would say no to parties, alcohol, and anything that could hurt my chances of being a professional athlete. I quickly made an idol of my sport, and my need for success in my sport led to many different actions that I would justify as right because of my love of baseball. I thought I had all the answers and felt that God had given me the blessing to make decisions on my own without ever truly reading or studying the Bible to see what he truly commands of his children. My time for prayer was at a bare minimum, as I would only pray where I needed help in something. I had a deep desire to follow my own unregenerate heart and to take full control of my life. I liked where I was, and I believed I had gotten myself there with the help from God. In college, I met a ministry group, and as they invited me to their Bible studies and church groups, I loved the things I heard. I started learning of some of my sin, but I was more happy with the things I found out about having to do a few steps and to say that I believed a few things and I would become a believer. I got baptized a few months after. I briefly studied the the gospel, attending church irregularly, and having no eagerness to serve in God's church. Sadly, I saw my baptism as a challenge for God. It gave me one more tool to reach my selfish goals as I try to gain success in this world. I would continue to indulge in my sin that was not so bad in my mind, like profanity, listening to secular music, and giving in to my lustful thoughts. I felt justified because of my sinful comparisons of sin to other people's sin. Throughout the years, I fought myself with anxiety, depression, and episodes of anger that I could not explain. I would go through episodes of being completely lost, feeling empty and with no purpose. I didn't know why most of the time, and the only time I did know why was because I didn't, things didn't go the way I wanted them to. I would continue to stumble throughout any trials as expected in a life centered around me and not Christ. Temptation quickly grew from secular music, bad language, and poor discipline to indulging in alcohol, drugs, and feeding my fleshly desires. I would look for any type of way just to enjoy my life. Although I never forgot that God existed, my twisted, sin-filled mind was on a path to self-destruction, and I would use scriptures in my own deceiving way to lead a life towards condemnation. By God's perfect design, my wife and I heard about and started attending Grace Bible Church in 2020. She had been so loving and kind towards me during my weak faith that I started to see my own total depravity. I learned to self-examine through the great teachings of the Bible, and I quickly realized I didn't know how to lead a marriage. My need for a savior had never felt so great. God transformed my weak faith into a gospel-centered faith that was focused solely on the cross, and nothing of my own doing could add or take away from that truth. I was broken. And God rescued me and turned me into a, per, into a new creation that truly fears him. And I felt the desire to obey and the need to obey. God revealed himself right before my eyes through every word of scripture that I continue to study, listen to, and read. Truths like Proverbs twenty-eight thirteen: He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion drove my heart to repentance. I repented from my little sins, the big ones, the ones I didn't think were so bad, and the ones that I planned on concealing to my death. I had told myself I would never tell some things, and God quickly drove me to repentance and to want to shout them. I was clearly broken, and I needed a Savior. As these sorrowful feelings towards my wretched self had been brought out and clearly shown through these texts, his grace and forgiveness towards me was not only read about, but I felt it. It drove my soul to rest and to rejoice in our, Jesus, in our Savior, Jesus Christ. My marriage has been transformed to a marriage centered in Christ. My wife and I now live a life that is guided by the Holy Spirit to bring glory and honor to God. We pray that our actions show our roots And as I have repented from my past for seeing my previous baptism as a challenge for God, I now come to rejoice and to act on the beautiful truths that are in God's word. I now choose to be baptized as a display of obedience that I have died along with Christ and risen as a new creation to submit to his commandments, 
to display my love for Jesus Christ as he first loved me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these three testimonies of your kindness, trophies of your grace, loved by you through the death of your Son. They are yours, and we give you praise for the supernatural work you've done in them. And we pray now for everyone in this room who has heard the gospel and seen the gospel's work in real life, that we who know you would remember our own lostness, be reminded of being loved by you, being transformed by you. God, we remember afresh what it is to think on your grace. Make us bold with the gospel as we go forward from here. And I pray that all those whose souls are not settled with you, that you would bring them to repentance and faith and life. We pray it in Christ's name.